Hi there, this is reading Lila, An Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Piersig, and this is Chapter 6. Richard Regal awoke and looked at his watch. It was 7.45 already. He felt tired and cross. He had not had much sleep since that fool author and Lila Blewett stumbled across his deck. All night long, in and out, in and out, the wakes from the passing boats caused that author's barge next to him to push his own boat in and out against the dock like a railroad Pullman car and there was nothing he could do about it. He could have gotten up and adjusted the author's lines himself, but that wasn't his job. What was really angering was that he hadn't even granted the author permission to raft. The author had been told in Oswego that he could raft because of the emergency there and evidently had taken it as a lifetime privilege. Now no more sleep was possible. He would have to make the best of it. Bill would have to get up too. There was much to be done today. Richard Regal went to the fore cabin of the boat, found Capella with a pillow over his head, and pulled it off. Get up, Bill, he said. Capella opened his eyes, looked startled, and then sat up quickly. Much to do today, Regal repeated. Capella yawned and looked at his watch. They said they'd take us at nine to get the mast up. Regal replied, we should be ready for an earlier opening. He went back to his aft cabin, removed his pajamas, carefully folded them, and put them in the drawer. Only a week left before going back. He could get Simonson to take over his court appearances, but if he were lucky and there were no more delays, he might still get back in time. What a completely rotten vacation. Capella's voice said, What about next door? You mean the great author? Regal replied, I don't think the great author will be up this morning. Why not? Capella asked. Didn't you hear him last night? No. You certainly must have been sleeping soundly. Of course, you were forward. He fell on my cabin. He fell? Yes. He and that woman he was dancing with stumbled across the deck and fell, evidently. I didn't want to get into it, so I didn't go up there. What a commotion. In the boat's head, Richard Regal drew a basin of heated water with which to wash his face and shave. He said loudly, We've got to get free of his boat before we can move. You'll have to go over and wake him up. Wake him up, Capella repeated. Yes, Richard Regal replied. He was in no condition to set an alarm clock. He added more softly, I wonder what his situation is to pick up someone like her. The water was steaming hot, but there wasn't much satisfaction in that now. Two years ago, it had cost him an arm and a leg to have this hot water system installed. He had to wait the whole summer for it. Now he was selling the boat. Everything changes. Nothing is predictable anymore. Regal vigorously soaked the warm washcloth and applied it to his face. He thought the great author's respectful readers should have seen him last night dancing with Lila. They probably wouldn't have minded, though, amongst his respectful readers. Drunkenness and whoring was probably considered some form of quality. It was interesting to get a look at someone like him up close. In Oswego, he seemed so reserved. They look so fine from a distance, but when you see them up close for what they really are, then all the cracks and the blemishes appear. He wasn't reserved. He was just boorish. Last night was typical. After listening to the author talk on and on about some pet idea about nothingness, Regal tried to illustrate the point with a fishing story. The great author didn't even listen. Regal had tried to warn him about sailing alone offshore, and he wouldn't listen. And then, after he had warned him about Lila, he had the nerve to invite her to their table. Boorish. What made it so hard to stand was that it wasn't deliberate. He just didn't know any better. He seemed so naive most of the time, and yet there was something clever about him that infuriated. He shouldn't make him so angry like this. He didn't really matter that much. If he wasn't careful, he was going to cut himself with this razor. There were enough people like that, of course, but what made this all so insufferable was that there was a man who was passing himself off as an expert on quality with a capital Q, and he got away with it. It was like watching some ambulance chaser sway a jury. Once he got them emotionally on his side, there wasn't much he could do about it. Richard Regal emptied the basin, rinsed it neatly, and folded the towel and put it on its rack to dry properly. Capella said, if I'm going to wake him up, what am I going to tell him about his boat? Regal thought for a while. I suppose I should be the one to talk to him, he said. 
He would do it tactfully. He'd invite him to breakfast, and then when the author turned the invitation down, he would be up and awake so that he could be told his boat needed moving. Now clean and shaven, Richard Regal felt a little better. He watched in the mirror as he combed his hair into respectability. Then he tried on a tie. It didn't look right. With Cary Grant features like his own, it would have been inappropriate to be overdressed, particularly in a place like this. He removed the tie, unbuttoned the collar, and carefully opened it a little. Much better. He climbed to the deck and looked around at the harbor. There were old riding timbers and hulks that had to be crossed by a series of precarious gangplanks to get to dry land. One was lucky if he didn't break his neck. Probably it would be a whole day wasted here. Richard Regal turned and was surprised to see himself being watched. The great author himself was in the next cockpit. Hello, Richard Regal said loudly. Hello. His neighbor's expression seemed bland. He was wearing the same blue chambray shirt he had worn yesterday with the same food stain above one pocket. I didn't expect to find you up this early, Richard Regal said. The author replied, If you want to take your boat down to the crane dock, I can cast off now. He must be some sort of mind reader, Regal thought. He said, There may be another boat at the dock. No, I checked. He seemed to be in remarkably good shape after his performance last night. He would be, Regal thought. It's still too early, Regal said. There may be a boat scheduled ahead of me. Are you interested in breakfast? As he said it, he realized it was no longer necessary to invite the author to breakfast, but it was too late. That sounds good, the author answered. I'll see if I can get Lila up. What? Richard Regal was startled. No, of course not. Let the woman have her sleep. Just you come. Why? the author asked. There it was again, that boorishness. He knew perfectly well why. Because this is undoubtedly the last time we will be seeing one another, Regal smiled, and I would prefer to chat alone. Capella appeared on the deck, and the three crossed the gangplanks to the shore in a single file. Inside the restaurant, Capella said, It's hard to believe this is the same place. Regal saw the jukebox silent in one corner. Be thankful for small favors, he said. The blackboard in front of the bar mirror contained the breakfast menu. Beside it, an old woman talked across the bar to three workmen eating breakfast at the table beside them, probably the wife of the last night's bartender, he thought. The author was being his indifferent self again. His intentions seemed to drift outside the window toward the boatyard debris and docks where they had come from. Perhaps he was looking for Lila. Capella said to him, Where did you learn to dance like that? You really stopped the action. The author's attention returned. Why? he asked. Were you watching? Everybody was, R Richard Regal said. No, the author grinned. I don't know how to dance. He looked quizzically at both of them. You're way too modest, Regal smiled. You dazzled us all, particularly the lady. The author looked at them suspiciously. Ah, you people are teasing. Maybe you had so much to drink you don't remember. Capella laughed, and the author exclaimed, I wasn't so drunk. No, you weren't so drunk, Regal said. That's why you tiptoed so softly across my deck at two. Sorry about that, the author said. She dropped her suitcase. Regal and Capella looked at each other. Suitcase, Capella said. Yes, the author answered. She's leaving the boat she was on and coming with me to Manhattan to stay with some friends there. Wow, Capella said, winking at Regal. One dance with him and they pack up their suitcases. He said to Regal, I wish I knew his secret. How do you suppose he does it? Richard Regal frowned and looked around. He didn't like the direction this was going. He wondered when the old woman was going to take their order. He motioned her to come. When she arrived, he ordered ham and eggs and toast and orange juice. The others ordered, too. While they were waiting, Richard Regal said that the tide would turn at about 10. He told the author the best strategy was to wait until about 9 o'clock, which was the last hour of the flood tide, and then go as fast as possible with the ebb tide as far as he could, before the tide changed again, more for the night, and wait for the next day's ebb into Manhattan. The author thanked him for the information. They ate most of the breakfast in silence. Regal felt stymied, pushed into a corner by this person. There was something about him that prevented you from saying anything to him, something that didn't leave you any room to say it. He was in such another world, talking so glibly about quality. When they were finished eating, Richard Regal turned to the author. He didn't like what he had to say to him, but he felt an obligation to say it anyway. It's none of your business with whom you select for company, he said. But you seemed to pay no attention to me at all last night. 
and I think I have an obligation to advise you one last time to get Lila off your boat. The author looked surprised. I thought you said I needed a crew, not her. What's wrong with her? There it was again. You're not that naive, Gail said. The author mumbled almost to himself. Lila may be better than she looks. Richard Gail contradicted him. No, Lila is much worse than she looks. The author looked at Capella, who was smiling, and then at Regal with narrowing eyes. What makes you think that? Richard Regal studied the author for a while. The author really was innocent. I've known Lila Blewett for a long, long time, he said. Why don't you just take my word for it? Who is she, the author said. She's a very unfortunate person of very low quality, he said. At the word quality, the author looked up as though it was some kind of challenge thrown at him. It was, of course. The author's eyes shifted. What does she do for a living, he asked evasively. When Capella glanced at him, Richard Regal couldn't resist a smile. She meets people like you, my friend, he said. Didn't anyone ever tell you about people like her? Another challenge. The wheels were turning almost visibly inside the author's head. Regal wondered whether to push it any further. There was no point in doing so, really. But there was something about the author's complacency, particularly after last night, that made him want to do it anyway. But then he decided not to. If you need a crew, he said, why don't you wait a few days in Manhattan and then Bill will be available. I think Bill knows enough that the two of you could make it. Bill nodded with a smile. They talked more about the sale into Manhattan. It was all straightforward. They should call ahead to the 79th Street Marina, since even this late in the year, it was hard to get in there without a reservation. An October cruise to the Chesapeake might be something he would enjoy himself, Regal said, but of course he wouldn't have the time. The author said suddenly, I don't think you know what you're talking about. How do you know that? Know what? Regal said. About Lila. I know it from the experience of a very close friend whose divorce case I handled. Richard Regal answered. In his memory, a picture returned of Lila, arm in arm with Jim, coming into his office. Poor Jim, he thought. Your friend Lila completely ruined his life. She used to be much more attractive than she is now, Regal added. She seems to be going downhill fast. Capella said, you never told me about that. It's not a public matter, Regal said, and I won't mention his name, Bill, or you'd recognize it. Then he looked at the author seriously. You've never seen such a sad, forsaken man. He lost his wife, his children, most of his friends. His reputation was gone. He had quit his job at the bank where he had a promising future. In fact, he was scheduled for a vice presidency. Eventually, he had to move to get reestablished. But knowing the bank's vice president, I'm sure he put it on Jim's record. And that was the end of his career, I'm afraid. No board will ever promote him to any position of real responsibility. That's really bad, the author said, and looked down at the table. It was completely necessary, Richard Regal said. No one wants to trust millions of dollars to a man who hasn't enough self-control to keep his hands off a common bar whore. Another challenge. This time the author's eyes hardened. It looked as though he was going to take it. Who was to blame, he said. What do you mean, Richard Regal asked. I mean, was it Lila who was to blame for your friend's misfortune? Or was it his wife or his so-called friends and his peers at the bank who really did him in? I don't follow, Richard Regal said. Was it her love or was it their hatred? I wouldn't call it love. Would you call it hatred on their part? What exactly did he do to them that justified their hatred? Now you're no longer being naive, Richard Regal said. You're being deliberately stupid. Are you trying to tell me his wife had no right to be angry? The author thought for a while. I don't know, he said, but there's something wrong here. I think there is, Richard Gale said. There's always been something wrong logically, the author went on. How can an act of love that does no injury to anyone be so evil? Think about it. Who was injured? Richard Gale thought about it. He said, it wasn't any act of love. Lila Blewett doesn't know what love means. It was an act of deceit. He could feel anger growing. I've heard that word love so many times from the mouths of so many people who don't know what it is. He could still see Jim's wife sitting in his office. She had shielded her eyes with her hand and tried hard to keep her voice steady. There was love. 
He said, let me try another word, honor. The person we are talking about dishonored his wife, and he dishonored his children, and he dishonored everyone who put trust in him as well as himself. People forgave him for his weakness, but they lost respect for him, and that was what finished him for any position of responsibility. But that wasn't weakness on Lila's part. She knew what she was doing. The author stared at him, dumbly it seemed. And I don't know what the circumstances of your own personal family are, my friend, but I warn you, if you're not careful, she'll do it to you. As an afterthought, he added, if she hasn't already. Regal looked at the author to see what the effect was. There was no change of expression. Nothing apparently penetrated that thick crust. But who did she hurt? Capella asked. Regal looked at Bill with surprise. Him too? He thought Capella was more sensible. It was a sign of the times. Well, there are some of us left, he said, returning to the author, who are still holding out against your hedonistic quality philosophy or whatever it is. I was just asking a question, the author said, but it's a question that expresses a certain point of view, Richard Regal answered, and it's a point of view that some people, including myself, find loathsome. I'm still not sure why. God, he was insufferable. All right, I'll tell you why. Will you listen? Of course. No, I mean, will you really listen? The author was silent. You made a statement in your book that everyone knows and agrees what quality is. Obviously, everyone does not. You refuse to define quality, thus preventing any argument on the subject. You tell us that dialecticians who debate these matters are scoundrels. I guess that would include lawyers, too. That's pretty good. You carefully tie your critics' hands and feet so that they cannot give you any opposition, tar their reputations for good measure, and then say, okay, come on out and fight. Very brave. Very brave. May I come out and fight? The author said. My exact statement was that people do disagree as to what quality is, but their disagreement is only in the objects which they think quality inheres. What's the difference? Quality, on which there is complete agreement, is a universal source of things. The objects about what people disagree are merely transitory. My, oh my, what smart talk, Richard Rebell thought. What universal source of things? Some of us can do without that universal source of things that no one else seems to be able to talk about but you. Some of us would rather stick with our good old-fashioned transitory objects. By the way, how do you keep in touch with that marvelous universal source of things? Do you have some sort of special radio set? Hmm? How do you keep in touch? The author did not answer. I'm waiting to hear, Regal said. How do you keep in touch with quality? The author still didn't answer. Relief poured through Richard Regal. He suddenly felt better than he had all morning. He finally communicated something to him. There are answers, the author finally said, but I don't think I can give them all to you this morning. He wasn't going to get off that easy. Let me ask an easier question then, Richard Regal said. You're in contact with this universal source of things, aren't you? Yes, said the author. You are too, if you'd only understand it. Well, I'm trying said Richard Regal, but you're just going to have to help me a little. This universal source of things, moreover, tells you what's good and what's not good, doesn't it? Isn't that right? Yes, said the author. Well, we've been talking in a rather general way so far. Now let me ask you a rather specific question. Did the universal source of things that is responsible for the creation of heaven and earth broadcast on your radio receiver as you stumbled across my boat at 2 a.m. this morning that the woman you were stumbling with was an angel of quality? What? The author asked. I'll repeat, he said. Did God tell you that Miss Lila M. Blewett of Rochester, New York, with whom you stumbled across my deck at 2 this morning, has quality? What God? Forget God. Do you personally think Miss Lila M. Blewett is a woman of quality? Yes. Richard Regal stopped. He hadn't expected this answer. Could the great author really be so stupid? Maybe he had a trick up his sleeve. But Richard Regal waited, but nothing came. Well, he said after a long pause, the great source of all things is really coming up with some surprises these days. He leaned forward and addressed the great author with deep gravity. Please will you, in future days, consider the possibility that the great source of all things that speaks only to you and not to me is 
like so many of your ideas, just a figment of your own fertile imagination, a figment that allows you to justify any act of your own immorality as somehow God-given. I consider that undefined quality to be a very dangerous commodity. It's the stuff fools and fanatics are made of. He waited for the author to drop his gaze or wince or blanch or get angry or walk out or give some sign of defeat, but he seemed just to settle back in his usual detachment. He's really out of it, Richard Regal thought. But no matter, the spine of his whole case for quality was broken. When the old woman came back to take their dishes, the author finally asked, Do you get along entirely without quality? He can't defend himself, Richard Regal thought, and now he wants to cross-examine me. He looked at his watch. There was enough time. No, I don't get along without quality entirely, he said. Then how do you define it? Richard Gell settled back in his chair. To begin with, he said, quality that is independent of experience doesn't exist. I've done very well without it all these years, and I'm sure I will continue without any difficulty whatsoever. The author interrupted. I didn't say quality was independent of experience. Well, now you asked me to define quality, Richard Regal snapped, and I started to do that. Why don't you just let me continue? All right. I find quality to be always involved with experience of specific things. But if you ask me which things have quality and which don't, I'd have a hard time answering without enumerating. But I'd say that in general, and with many qualifications, quality is found in values I've learned in childhood and grown up with and used all my life and have found nothing wrong with. Those are values that are shared by personal friends and family, my law associates and other companions. Because we believe in these common values, we're able to act morally towards one another. In the practice of law, he said, we come into contact with a fair-sized number of people who do not share traditional moral values, but feel rather that what is good and what is bad is a matter of their own independent judgment. Does that sound familiar? The author nodded. He better. He could hardly do anything else. Well. We give them a name, Regal continued. We call them criminals. The author looked as if he wanted to interrupt again, but Regal waved him down. Now, you may argue, and many do, that the values of the community and the laws they produce are all wrong. That's permissible. The law of the land guarantees you the right to hold that opinion, and moreover, the laws provide you with political and judicial recourse by which to change the bad laws of the community. But as long as those recourses are there, and until those laws are changed, neither you or Lila or anyone else can just go acting as you please in disregard of everyone else, deciding what does and what does not have quality. You do have a moral and legal obligation to obey the same rules others do. Regal continued, One of the things that angered me most about your book was its appearance at a time when so many young people all over, all over the country put themselves above the law with criminal acts, draft dodgers, arsonists, political traitors, revolutionists, even assassins, all of them justifying themselves with the belief that they alone can see the God-given truth that no one else can see. You talk for chapter after chapter about how to preserve the underlying form of a motorcycle, but you didn't say a single word about how to preserve the underlying form of society. And so your book may have been a big seller among some of those radicals and cult groups who were looking for that sort of thing. They're looking for anything that will justify their doing as they please. And you gave them support. You gave them encouragement. He felt his voice becoming angry. I've no doubt that your intentions were good, but whatever your intentions may be, it was the devil's work you were doing. He sat back. The author looked stunned. Good. Capella looked sober, too. Good. Bill was a good boy. These radical intellectuals can sometimes get hold of people his age and fill them with their damned fads and get them believing them because they aren't old enough yet to see what the world is really like. But Bill Capella, he had hopes for. It's not the devil's work I'm doing, said the author. You're trying to do what has quality, isn't that right? Yes, the author said. Well, do you see what happens when you get all involved in fine-sounding words that nobody can define? That's why we have laws to define what quality is. These definitions may not be perfect as you'd like them, but I can promise you they're a whole lot better than having everybody run around doing as he pleases. We've seen the results of that. The author looked confused. Capella looked amazed. Richard Regal felt pleased at that. He had made his point at last, and he always enjoyed that, even when he wasn't getting paid for it. 
That was his skill. Maybe he should write a book about quality and what it really was. Tell me, he said, do you really and sincerely believe that Lila Blewett has quality? The author thought for a long time. Yes, he said. Well, why don't you try to explain to us how on earth you can possibly think that Lila has quality? Do you think you can do that? No, I don't think I can. Why not? It's too difficult. It wasn't an answer Richard Regal had expected. He saw it was time to put it into this and leave. Well, he said consolatingly, maybe there's something I don't see. I think so, the author said. He sounded sick. He had been sailing alone for a long time now. Richard Regal looked again at his watch. It was time to go. Let me say just one last thing, he said, and I hope you will not take it as a personal insult, but rather as something to think about. I've noticed last night, and in Oswego, that you are one of the most isolated individuals I have ever seen. I think you will always be that way unless, by some possibility, you find your way to understanding and integrating yourself with the values of the community around you. Other people count. You should understand that. I understand that, the author began. But it was clear to Regal that he didn't. We must go, he said to Capella, and got up from the table. He went to the bar, paid the check, and joined the author at the door. I'm surprised you listened to me just now, Richard Regal said, as they walked toward their boats at the dock. I really didn't think you were capable of that. As the boats came into view, they saw Lila standing on the deck of the boat. She waved to them. They all waved back.